So we will stick into this uh, inequality of opportunity framework. Today I'm talking about a country that some people in the room here know better than I do. So uh, it's in, with all humility that I will be talking about Egypt. Why? Because Egypt is a good player on this. They have data. Uh, I, I'm originally from Lebanon. No data, so I cannot talk about uh, <laughs> Lebanon. Um, so uh, I will talk about... Uh, gender stratification, social class at birth, and inequality of opportunity. So our objective here is to look at the evolution of inequality of opportunity and to split it into two components, one due to gender stratification and the other one due to uh, social class at birth. In order to do this, and I hope you'll cope with me, we need to present a measurement framework. Um, so there will be some methodology. Uh, I will keep it as soft as possible. I will display the math, but I will talk in words. And I've prepared a few graphs to explain what uh, I have in mind. So if we think about stratification, um, so uh, sociologists have been talking about uh, stratification for a while. In economics, it's relatively new. Uh, so if you look at the Journal of Economic Literature, June 2022, so there is a complete uh, issue on race and the economic literature. And within this issue, there are many papers on racial stratification. And uh, if you think about racial stratification, it comes from the black radical tradition uh, in the US. And it has been imported into economics by Sandy Darity, uh, who proposed a, a, a new field that is called economics of stratification. And this field has two components. One is theories, how these stratification emerge, how they are explained. And another one is measurement. So I'll stick to the measurement part. Okay? Because it's important to be able to measure in order to test the theories. Um, so, um, Darity uh, argues essentially that unless we make strong assumption that marginalized group uh, behave and they make choice that, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that go against their own interests, we should consider differences on identity or inequality that are based on identity as unfair. Stephanie Seguino borrowed this idea of uh, racial stratification and brings it into the gender sphere. And she defines, as uh, she talks about gender stratification, and she defines what in her mind constitutes uh, gender justice in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the, this idea of gender stratification. And she says we achieve perfect gender justice if the probability of achieving each social position or each social outcome is exactly the same for each uh, uh, identity group. We've been talking about inequality of opportunity all the day. For those who were in the same session than I was, uh, this is linked with inequality of opportunity. So let's go back to Romer, 1998. So the first paper that brought this philosophical idea of equal opportunity into economics. And um, in this paper, Romer distinguishes two types of inequality. But I, I, I should not insist on that. But one that is due to responsible individual decision on effort. This is called accountable effort. And this is considered unfair. And the other inequalities are, no, this is considered as fair. So, sorry, I'm, I'm inversing. Uh, so there is a reward principle to effort. And inequalities due to the birth lottery. And this is considered uh, unfair and inefficient in addition. Um, Romer in this paper shows that if the distribution of residual luck is independent of initial circumstances, if it's the same for all initial circumstances, then perfect equality of opportunity, and this is the important part, requires that the conditional quantile function is the same, so conditional on circumstances of, uh, uh, sorry, at birth is the same for any possible circumstance at birth. If we, and so if we look at this condition and we think about Seguino's condition, if we include identity, gender identity or racial identity into the Romer framework, 
both are the same, essentially. So what do we want to do? We want to provide a framework that allows us to measure uh, intergroup identities in equality related to identity-based stratification. So now I'm moving out of gender, and I talk in general about identity-based, and I, when I will come back to Egypt, we'll look at gender stratification. So we, what we do here, we build the link between, the, <coughs> sorry, this literature on measurement of inequality of opportunity and the literature on the economics of stratification. What do we do? We provide this measurement framework and, and, and that, are, uh, that can split this identity into identity-based stratification and the other part that is due to social class at birth. And we apply this framework to study the evolution of gender stratification in Egypt. And if you can cope with me, there until the end, it's very interesting. <laughs> what we don't do, we don't offer a theoretical explanation of the emergence of these uh, stratification or of the change that I will present. I will present some changes. If you have some theory to explain that, I'll leave it to you to do that. I'm not doing this. Uh, I'm not and we're not because my quarter is in the room. I should not say I because she will get angry <laughs> at me. Um, so uh, we adapt the inequality measurement framework to allow to, for this kind of decomposition. In order to do that, we borrow on the idea of Temkin. So in 1986, Temkin publishes a paper in philosophy and uh, public policy, and it defines inequality as an aggregation of complaints. So we'll use this idea, and what Temkin says, he says, individuals who have the same merit should have the same outcome. We bring this into Romer's framework, and how do we define merit? The same level of responsible effort. It's very simple. It's, it's kind of the, the best framework to, to put this. Uh, so here, keep in mind that we are not focusing on individual outcome. As you will see, once we start the estimation process, we don't care about individual outcome. We care about this conditional quantile function that we are trying to recover. We develop distributional properties that these indices should obey and derive for those who know, who know us a little bit better, uh, of course, dominance condition to allow for the ranking of the distribution without picking a specific index. And the empirical uh, application is our uh, contribution, so we study the evolution of gender stratification and equality of opportunity in Egypt, and it's fun, the story is fun. Um, so the measurement framework, so we borrow to Ro uh, on Romer, so essentially uh, Romer uh, has a production, an income production function that depends on initial circumstances. Uh, we have two special ones, age and identity group. The important one is this one. We split uh, the society into a dominant group and a marginalized group. Uh, age is just there to compare the, uh, the individual outcome with the person in the same age cohort because we don't want to compare 25 year old income with someone of, of 50 years old. Uh, the difference may be uh, justified. And um, so the big, and this assumption is very important and it is Romer assumption, this production function that is a function of the raw level of effort, age, all other circumstances at birth, group identity, and residual luck, uh, this function is strictly increasing in effort. And this is w one of the key assumptions. Uh, Romer argued that individuals' ability to produce this raw effort, like what will generate an income? Investing in education. But investment in education, as Rena explained, there, there are already inequality of opportunity in access to education. So what Romer says is, that is <coughs> part of uh, this effort, there are inequalities of opportunity, and the accountable effort will be the position in the cumulative distribution of raw effort conditional on initial circumstances. If, you, if, and it shows that, residual luck is statistically independent of initial circumstances, then the position in this cumulative distribution of raw effort and the, the conditional cumulative distribution of income are exactly the same. You can <laughs> define raw effort 
as the position in the conditional cumulative distribution. And this is fun because when we will talk about quantile function, so the P or the Q that you find in the quantile function is now interpreted as raw effort once it's uh, estimated. Uh, it's important to note here that in the empirical application, it's impossible to identify the effort level associated with one observation. Why? Because effort is unobservable and residual luck at the individual level is unobservable. But we can identify and estimate, and you all know that, the conditional quantile function. And this is what we are going to do. What is inequality in this framework? <clears throat> so Temkins uh, give many reference points in order to define a complaint, and one that is the one that we're picking is in comparison to the best of person that has the same merit. So what is this best of person that has the same merit in this model? It's essentially the uh, upper envelope of all conditional quantile function. With a graph, it's easier to explain. So assume we have a society with five, di four different uh, initial circumstances. Here you have the four different quantile function. And as you see between zero and E1, the, the green is the first. So uh, it's the quantile function of the first group that is at the top. Between E1 and E2, it's the second group that is at the top. And between E2 and 1, it's once again the first group. The, uh, the envelope is the dotted line that takes always the maximum value. It's easier to program, anyway, if you make this assumption in your uh, R code. How do we define <coughs> the complaint? So here, I'm assuming one particular level of uh, effort in order to explain. Uh, it's essentially the distance, so for um, an observation, or if you have initial circumstances A, X, and G, that are particular value, if this is the quantile function, then at E1 here, the distance between your quantile function and this upper envelope is your complaint. We transform this in relative term, and of course, we aggregate over all possible level of effort. We assume a weighted average. We don't make any strong assumption on this function. We just say this is non-negative and it should sum to one. And think of whatever. Of course, the standard average is one of these functions, but you can put some weight on the upper end, on the lower end. It will obey that. And the index of inequality of opportunity is just the average of that in the society. We define by Omega here, the set of all possible inequality of opportunity index that you can imagine that fits into this framework. <clears throat> the interesting thing, if you define the things like this, you can split this distance here into two distance. So assume that you are in the marginalized group. Then assume you produce another quantile function, conditional quantile function. Everything is the same except group identity. Then you have another quantile function. So the distance here in blue is identity stratification. And what remains is social class at birth impact on inequality of opportunity. And then you can decompose your index into two components. What we do in, <coughs> in uh, the, the paper, so we define curves. So we love stochastic dominance conditions. So we have curves. So we have the complaint incidence curve that gives this average value of the complete at each point of effort. And the interesting thing, if they do not intersect, the curve that is the lowest has lower inequality of opportunity. So you have this condition for inequality of opportunity overall, and you have similar condition for social class at birth and uh, identity stratification. Of course, sometimes this is not sufficient to get a ranking. We say, let's assume a little bit more structure to this weight function. We consider two possibilities. So one possibility would be to put more weight 
on lower level of effort. We call this ProPore because we didn't find any good name here, but it's not necessarily, we're not talking about the actual poor, we're talking about people that put a low level of effort for all possible combination of initial circumstances. If you have a ProPore view, this function will be decreasing, if you have a meritocratic view, and what is a meritocratic view? If you have in mind all these stories about glass ceilings and things like this, then you have a meritocratic view. Then you have more weight on the upper part, on high level of effort. Uh, but you're still averse to inequality in op of opportunities. And we define also curves that if they don't intersect, uh, then the curve that is the lowest has the lower level of inequality. I go very fast because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, estimation and inference. We use Chernogusukov, Fernandez, Val, and Meli, and we use standard uh, kind of dominance tests. I don't want to enter into this, but you, if you're interested, uh, we can send you a paper in a few days. We are finishing polishing it. Um, now let me talk about the Egyptian context. So it's enough for the math and the, the, the method. Now I'm coming to the, the real idea here. What is the story I want to tell? So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the small history of Egypt. So uh, you have Gamal Abdel Nasser, and it's the period of Arab nationalism. It's a centralized economy. Then you have Anwar al-Sadat that starts liberalization. It's accelerated under Hosni Mubarak. And this is the important story here. It's accelerated and it takes more and more the form of crony capitalism. So uh, uh, an economic system where if you the friend with someone in power, then you get rich. Of course, if you have an inequality of opportunity view, eh, this is not what you aim for. 2011, the Arab Spring. If you look at a paper uh, by El Rafai and Vol uh, 2020, uh, uh, support for redistribution in Egypt increased from 22% in 2008 to 59% of in 2012. So there was something here in the public opinion. Then you have a short elected government, Mohamed Morsi, a Muslim Brotherhood, or uh, not directly, but related to. And then after a few protests again, uh, a new regime, military regime, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. So this is where the story is framed. Uh, we use data that is made available by ERF. They're doing a fantastic job. I'm not employ an employee of ERF. They're making these data available to researchers, and I'm excited. <laughs> and so we use four waves of the Egypt Egyptian Labor Market Panel Survey. We use that outcome variable labor income, and uh, we have a set of initial circumstances, education of the parent, type of employment of the father, region of birth, year of birth, and gender. <clears throat> the ELMPS has a very interesting question. It's probably because of Raghi Assad, I'm not sure. They have information on the labor, the activity, the labor kind of activity that is called unpaid family worker. And it's an important one in the case of Egypt and Arab countries. Uh, labor economists, so understand Assad and Kraft, who study the labor market in Arab countries have this extended definition of the labor market that include this unpaid family worker. If you take this definition, it allows you to bring women into <laughs> your study of inequality. Um, we, uh, and of course, the, the, the interesting thing with the Chernozuka, Fernandez, and Meli approach, it allows you to estimate uh, this uh, distribution with probability mass. So um, the first thing that will come to, a, to, to the mind of someone is, it, okay, include the non-labor market participant at zero. We don't do this here, and we just refer to the authority, Assad, Kraft, Romer, and Saleh Isfahani in 2018. They explained that this is mainly rich people. <laughs> and if you do this, you distort the story of inequality of opportunity. We follow uh, their uh, their uh, lead. This is the complaint incidence curve, 2012, 2000, uh, no, 2006, 2012. Remember, if one is lower, and here you have the confidence band, and we run a, a statistical test also on this, 
you have lower inequality of opportunity in Egypt in 2012 compared to 2006. It was going down before the Arab Spring. This is consistent with Assad et al. also. We compare all year. So essentially, the story, I will go quickly, when you have omega all indices, if you have omega M, meritocratic view indices, omega P, pro-poor view indices. So if you look at this, the, the general story between 98, 2006, no change, no dominance, it means you pick an index, it will tell you it increases, you pick another one, it tells you it decreases. Between 2006 and 2012, uh, so if you compare 2012 with 2006, you have a significant reduction. Then if you compare 2012 and 2018, no dominance. So one index will tell you it's increasing, the other one it's decreasing. Let's look now at gender stratification. 2012, 2018. It's increasing, pro poor view. The, 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 the complete incidence for curve, it's not significant. But if you take a pro poor view, it's increasing. If you take a meritocratic view, it's increasing. If you look at the preceding period, 2006, 2012, it was going down. The complete story, between 98 and 2006, no dominance. Between 2006 and 2012, it's increasing, and it's decreasing. And between 2012 and 2018, it's decreasing. And in 2018, it's still higher than 1998, which is bad. If you decompose uh, for social class at birth, it's going down between 2012 and 2018, down. We have the same kind of dominance test. I'm accelerating. If you look at the story for men, since inequality of opportunity due to social class at birth is going down for all the years, and the men, the dominant group, are only impacted by this channel, the story is very good for men. It's going down all the time, and even between 2012 and 2018, women are affected by both channels, so we are unsure what is the impact on women. As we could, you could guess, no, no change between 98 and 2006. Between 2006 and 2012, it was going down. And between 2012 and 2018, it's increasing. So you give me one extra minute. So we develop a framework to measure inequality of opportunity and to decompose in a, in a gender stratification and social class at birth component. Uh, um, we do this, we provide the dominance condition, and we use standard econometric method to estimate and uh, run our test. We offer an empirical application on gender stratification in Egypt. This 20 years period, and let me summarize, is interesting because we had this Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring, the main request, and uh, Rana explained it, was we want more equality. And I'm not saying the government, I'm not saying anyone, the social structure changes in a way that faced with a demand for more equality, it adjusts, it seems to adjust, uh, well, <laughs> by decreasing the burden of inequality of opportunity on the dominant group, by increasing it on the marginalized group. So this is a particular story, but I think it's a very sexy result. And of course, this can be applied to any other identity marker if you have the right data. And if you have many identity make marker with a good data set with enough observation, you may want to look at intersection of these identity, uh, so race and gender together. And that's all I had to say. Thank you for your attention.